So my name is Eskel Steinberg, and I'm going to give a talk about drama in games. So uh, I've been working on something called the pivot model for over 10 years, which is a way to understand how games work. Um, mostly I work in video games, but it actually works in any kind of game, so a board game or a sport or anything like that. But basically I've been trying to understand how do we create story and drama within games. And uh, it feels like when it comes to games, we don't quite know what to do. Um, there are three major approaches that people kind of take to, to story and drama in games. And I, all, I always felt that they were kind of wrong. So I want to go through uh, sort of what the, the current thinking of, of story is. And the first very obvious one is, why not just make a game that tells a story, right? So there's lots of games that do this, like big narrative arcs, right? And we know how to tell stories. There is like a beginning, middle, and end. We have protagonists, and we have all these like ideas from movies and, and uh, books that we can just like put right in there. Um, there are, however, some problems with that. Um, the first is, I actually think that interactive storytelling is an oxymoron. So right now, I'm giving a talk to you, and you all understand that as part of this thing we're doing right now, you're not supposed to talk back at me. If you start arguing with me, you're ruining the thing that is going on, right? And that's kind of what a storytelling is. Storytelling is somebody telling you something. It's not story dialogue, right? So the rules is sort of a one-way street. And if you're trying to make that interactive, you're sort of ruining it, right? It's like, it's, it's not built for that. So that's, that's the first problem we have. So that turns into control. And if you uh, play a, a game that has a narrative, they spend a lot of time controlling the player, right? They want you to look at the right spot. They don't want you to miss anything important. They do all these tricks to think you're in control and look, oh, you can walk anywhere you want, but really you have to walk this path because this is the path, this is the story we're trying to tell you. And if you ask any filmmaker, like, why do you put the camera there? Why can't just like the, some random person in the audience put the camera wherever they want? They're like, no, I want control. I want to, I want to frame this shot exactly this way for this particular meaning so that the audience feels this thing, right? And everything is very meticulously thought out. And as, as soon as you throw in a player to that that is trying to do their thing, you're sort of just ruining it. So this is a big problem. So storytelling, in my opinion, is best as exposition. So what's exposition? Exposition is the bit in the movie they don't want to, that you need to know to watch the movie, but that they don't really care to show you. And a good example would be, you know, the Star Wars scroll. You know, this isn't Star Wars, right? Star Wars isn't text. It's like, spaceships and stuff like that, but they just start with this and say, okay, we're gonna get to the spaceships really quickly. We just need you to know some stuff, and it's gonna take forever if we had to show you all that. So let's just throw some text on. You'll read this for a couple of seconds, and I'll, I'll promise you it'll be a huge spaceship right after this, so don't worry, right? So this isn't really awesome for, you know, a filmmaker would dislike this, right? A filmmaker hates exposition. And if you go to film class, they will show you a movie like uh, Back to the Future that has a lot of information in it, right? There's a lot of backstory about 88 miles per hour and, you know, how the, how the contraption works and all that. And they're incredibly good at sort of giving you all that information sort of secretly without you noticing it. Like, so the first half hour of the movie is a lot of telling you the backstory, but it doesn't feel like they're telling you the backstory. It, it feels like the story's just going on, right? But they're actually sneaking in a lot of important information that will pay off later, right? So uh, that's kind of storytelling. So there's another thinking, which is like, well, we're interactive. Let's make it branching, right? Let's give players a bunch of choices, right? And we'll say if they choose this door, this happens. If this door, that happens. That's awesome, right? We'll solve it that way. And you build these really complicated sort of graphs of what's going to happen in the story, right? 
And this can be super expensive. So people think about lots of clever ways to sort of make it all work. But these have some fundamental issues too. This is my fundamental issue. This is a 10-year-old Hitler. So let's imagine you went to the store or you know, went on Steam or whatever, and you bought this World War II game. And in the screenshots, there's like um, Battle of the Bulge, there is like Stalingrad, there is like the Battle of Britain, there is like chasing Rommel across the desert. There's all these like set pieces from World War II, right? And you're like, awesome, I'm gonna go home and play this. And then you start the game, and the first scene in the game is, is 1901. You're in Austria in the backyard of a house, a small house. And there's a kid, a 10-year-old kid playing there. And it's Hitler. And you have a gun. You can kill Hitler, right? You can save six million Jews. You can, you can you know, change the history. The problem is... You don't want to kill Hitler because if you don't, if you kill Hitler, you don't get to, you know, fight the Battle of Stalingrad, and you don't get to, you know, fight Rommel and you know Battle of Britain. That's why you bought the game, right? You definitely need Hitler to to take uh, power and you know start his Nazi regime. Otherwise, you have don't you don't have any Nazis to shoot at, right? So the problem here is that. Uh, designers can't trust the players, right? Because the players won't do what they really, you know, would have done, you know. You can argue that the designer was like, oh, I'm going to make this interesting thing about whether or not it's right to kill someone before they committed a crime and blah. The players don't care. The players is like, am I going to get to shoot Nazis or not? That's why I bought the game, right? So... Designers can't trust that the players do what sort of the role of the game is, right? And if you go online in any kind of branching narrative game, you'll find everybody asking, like, how do I get the good ending? You know, I, I'm not making the choices I want to actually make. I just want to make the end, you know, the choices that the, the, that the designer will give me the good ending. That's all I care about, right? There's actually a backwards one of this, which is that the players don't trust the designers either, right? Let's say you're playing a role-playing game and there's two doors and one says like all the treasure in the game and the other door it says like all the you know, horrible traps and monsters and a certain death. Which one will you go into? Well, immediately you think, wait a minute, there's something fishy in here. Of course the game designer is not gonna give me everything just by walking into a door, right? They don't trust you. And they, that means that, that whenever you are confronted with something, you're not, you're thinking of uh, sort of you deconstructing the designer, not the actual game, right? You're not making decisions as if the world looks like that. So this brings me to this which is I think that game designers are a little bit like fashion designers in the way that as a fashion designer, you're not really the important person, right? If you go to a fashion industry, you see this woman, you can be like, oh my God, that's a beautiful dress. It's so majestic and yada, yada. It's perfect. Wow, great. You know, and you applaud. You say, oh my God, the designer is great. Really beautiful dress. If you see this woman walking down the street, what's your reaction? It's like, man, that looks like one pompous, self-absorbed person, right? Because you're not judging whoever designed the dress. You're judging the person who thought that it was a good idea to wear this in public, right? That's a completely different thing, right? Those are not the same. This is a terrible dress to wear in public, in my opinion. The best dress ever is probably this. This is from Breakfast at Tiffany. This dress, little black dress, no one has any idea who made it or where it comes from, but it made her career, right? It's one of the most iconic looks in, in film history. Audrey Hepburn will forever be in that dress. Like, we always think of that. And that's because the dress put her in the center of it. We love her as a character because of her look and how, how she presents. This is successful fashion design. The previous thing is just showing off, right? That's not, you know, that's for the designer, not for the person wearing it. So if you think about it, that's kind of what we want in games, right? A really good game is not a game where you said, this thing happened in the game. It's a, something where we say like, 
this thing happened to me. I did this thing, right? When, when the player starts telling stories, that, that's where it becomes more powerful. An example that, I, that I've had myself is like, I, I had a friend who went to the cinema, and I asked him, like, how was the cinema? And he said, oh, you won't believe it. There was a guy sitting in front of me talking on the phone for an hour. It was horrible. And you're thinking about it, it's like, wait a minute. They spent $100 million making a movie, right? They had the best visual effects people in the world. They, you know, had planets exploding and, and like robots and what, aliens and whatever. And the guy who went to the movie, the, the number one thing he talks about is that there was a guy speaking on the phone. You know, why don't we make a movie where we just film a dude on the phone for an hour? People seem really engaged in that. That'll be way bigger than, you know, some Avengers movie. Of course, that won't work, right? Why won't it work? Well, because we care about the guy speaking on the phone because it happens to us, right? And we tell stories to each other all the time like, oh, I, I missed the bus, I was so close, or, you know, other riveting stories like that that, you know, wouldn't make it in Hollywood, but they're great to us because they happen to us. And that's a really key thing about games is that whatever happens in the games happens to us and therefore we're engaged with it. And Therefore, we can say that games are fundamentally different um, in, in, you know, in comparison with what, uh, linear media, right? And one example that I have is like, if you go to any storytelling class, they'll be like, oh, you got to think about your protagonist being likable, right? Because when you watch a movie, if the guy you're supposed to follow is an asshole, you're like, I don't care what happens to this guy. I don't want him to get the girl. The girl should run away. He's an asshole, right? So you don't want to see the ending. You want to switch it off, right? But in a video game, you can play a game like Tetris, and it, like, you don't care. Like, there's no person. There's no, you don't need an attachment to somebody because it's you. You want to win at Tetris, right? And that's why in a video game, you can be an asshole all you want, and most players want to win anyway because, you know, people who are assholes also want to win. Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to lose. Nobody ever goes to the, you know, point where they say, I think I've been a, enough of an asshole now that I should die. Like, that's not how people think. People root for themselves. And we don't need to work on sort of engaging them in that. Whereas in storytelling, that's key, because unless we, you know, we're trying to have empathy for something, and if we lose that empathy, it's game over, right? So let's think about another sim idea. Let's think about simulation, right? What if we just like simulate everything, and we'll make this really complex world where everything can happen, and then, then everything will be amazing, and amazing things will happen. Why don't we do that? Well, there's a couple of problems with that. Um, if complexity is so good, why is reality so dull? Like, if, if the measure of a good game would be how well it simulated stuff and complexity, why would we play video games in the first place? We have reality. It's awesome. It's like, you can look at, like, take out a magnifying glass, and you'll see they worked on those details. Wow, you can go into anywhere on the ground, and there'll be tiny rocks that are there, right? And it we still go like, oh, I want to play an 8-bit video game, right, where the blocks are this big and, you know, it's super simple. So complexity doesn't actually seem to work, right? More detail doesn't really help. In fact, a lot of times we want to play games because there's less detail, right? It's nice to be in a world where, you know, all you need to get a date is just get to the castle, the, the last castle, and that's where the princess is, and that's it. That's your whole dating. There's no, you know, complexity at all, right? That's kind of what we like. You know, what if you could earn money just by, you know, collecting going, gold coins on the street? That'd be great, right? Um, the other thing is this, right? So this is James Bond, and s someone might f um, have a uh, experience a bar fight. That that happens in real life. Somebody may even be in a uh, a gunfight, that happens in real life. Some people may be in a car chase. Some people jump out of airplanes. And some people meet the love of their lives. Nobody does all of those things within two days. 
right? James Bond does that within two days. That's the magic of story, right? Reality doesn't sort of have, you know, cool shit happens, but not very often. So it's kind of dull, right? So we need something to sort of crank it up, right? We need something that makes it more interesting. The next problem is sort of the butterfly effect, which is like, why do things happen in life? I don't know, you know, things happen randomly in life because the world is so complex that there's no way of knowing exactly why things happen. If you get a job, did you deserve it? I don't know, maybe if you were born in a different country or if you were, you know, you know went to a different school, didn't run into the right people, it's a bunch of chance. Sure, you probably helped a little bit, but it's, you know, there's a lot of randomness in there, right? Um, one of my all-time, you know, heroes is Ed Catmull, who is, uh, used to be president of Pixar. He's uh, written a book called Creative, Creativity, Inc., which I strongly recommend. And in it, he retells the story that when he was seven years old, his family was driving in a car, and they were driving on this road, and there was a, a cliff edge on one side, and there was a wall on the other side, and they come around a corner on the outer side, and a car comes and clips their mirror and just like drives past them. And if that car would have been a few centimeters further out, it would have taken the car, it would have pushed them off the edge and the whole family would have died, right? And every time somebody says, oh my God, you built Pixar and you made all these amazing movies and you want all these Oscars, you're amazing. He always thinks like, maybe we should give a little bit of credit to the guy who drove that car. Because if he just like slightly the wheels further out, none of these things would have happened, right? And that's kind of the scary thing about life. It's super random and you know, you, quite, you can't really tell things. And we don't like that, right? And um, I, I find that you know, I made a big game with lots of randomness in it and players will always blame me for random things, right? It's like one of the designers of World of Warcraft says that at least once a week for as long as they worked on it, somebody's come in and say, uh, the random number generator is broken, right? Because it's like, I got three in a row and you're not supposed to be able to get that, right? I have a 90% chance of winning this thing and I tried three times and I didn't get it. It must be broken. No, no, that's not how randomness work. So, games, however, are awesome. So, there is something here. Right? Games do create amazing stories. And we get to things like this. So this is like Intel Extreme Masters. And you have a, lots and lots of people in a room watching video games, just watching them, right? We all know how like, incredibly powerful games are. And I have thrown controllers in my life. If you're a gamer, you might have done the same thing. Uh, I have stormed out of rooms, I have pulled out uh, CDs out of machines and things like that, and I am a very calm player compared to a lot of people I know. Uh, you know, video games elicit a lot of emotions. I've never been to a, a library and had someone like streaming and ripping up a book because their favorite character died. Like that emotion I've never seen, right? And people talk about like, oh, video games are crude and don't tell stories and don't have drama, but, but books are, ooh, they're, not, they're so deep and, and great, right? So games are actually way more emotionally powerful. They're kind of crude, right? So if you wanna sort of make a story about um, a handicapped child in, in Africa during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, and you want to tell the story of how the tribe, whatever. Video games are kind of bad at that, right? Because there's a lot of finesse in that. There's a lot of sort of detail and things like that. But more like, yeah, I, I, I owned you. That stuff we're really good at, right? We're really powerful, but we're not, you know, we're not a scalpel, we're a sledgehammer. So, Let's try to understand why games work. Like Games do these things, but we, we don't kind of figure out why. So this has been my big research. So to do this, I built what I call the pivot model. And I'm going to start by just um, having a word of caution. I'm going to define what is and what isn't a game. 
I assume that there are lots of things that don't qualify as games that you all might be working on or love or things like that. And I always want to say, that's totally cool. I love lots of things that aren't games. But the reason I want to do this um, and define what is and what isn't a game is in order to understand it. So I'm trying to build a vocabulary of, of talking about games so that we can discuss them rather than saying, if you don't do this, you are wrong and you are evil or you know, you're, the thing you're working on is you know, not good. Like, Movies are clearly not video games, and they're awesome. I love movies. So, um, so I'm going to split up games into three major components. The first one is mechanics. So what are mechanics? Mechanics are sort of things that you can do in a game. Like, what are the transactional things you can do? And there are some rules for that. So they need to be known. It's like the rules of the game have to be known, otherwise you can't take decisions. If you don't know what's possible in the world, you can't, you know. They have to be interactive in some way so that you can change things and how the world work. They have to be predictable. If you press a button, you need to know what it does, right? If you press a button and it does random stuff, how do you know if pressing the button is a good idea. You can't take decisions, right? So everything here has to be completely cause and effect. Everything has to depend on things, and you should be able to reason about it, right? And it also defines the limits of the space, like what can I do? You know, this is the play field, this is where far as I can go, I can, you know, this is how many players on our team, or whatever, right? So what we get is kind of Legos, right? I call this actually a toy, right? Because Legos are pieces you can put together. There's some mechanics on what, you know, they, they snap together top to bottom, but they don't snap together side to side. And there are some rules like that. And once you learn them, you can build lots of cool stuff, right? But that's not a game. In order to make a game, we need one more thing. We need, we need a goal, right? Uh, with Lego, you can just build anything, but there's no reason to build anything. As soon as I give you a drawing, you know, the, it, that comes in the Lego box, then it becomes something else, right? Now you're supposed to do something, right? Now there's a reason for these Lego blocks to, to exist. So what did they do? Well, they give us made it motivation, but they also give us a value set. That means, that, you know, the closer we get to the goal, that's good. The further away we get from the goal, that's bad. And that means that all the, the interactions we do, they, they have meaning now. They're, we can ask questions like, does this make us closer or further away to, to where we're going? And actually, if we add those together, we get something in between, which is a puzzle, right? So a puzzle is basically, I give you a bunch of pieces, and you put them together in order to reach a goal, right? So a crossword puzzle is a great example, right? You can, you know, you have a space, you're supposed to fill in all the letters, make them all fit, make it all work, right? Another one which may not be quite as obvious is commuting, right? Going from your, job, uh, your home to your job, right? You have a bunch of streets, you have to navigate, you have to choose how to do it, right? You have, um, uh, you have to solve this sort of riddle, right? You, have, you know what you can do. You can drive left, you can drive right, you can drive forward, you can care about all these things, and eventually you get to work. Now, you might all said, this isn't a really good puzzle, right? It's kind of dull. Going to work is not fun. So actually, it is fun. It is a, a pretty good puzzle. The problem with a puzzle is that once you've solved it, you can solve it exactly the same way every time. And that's the problem, right? Figuring out how to get to a new office is interesting. Figuring out how to get there the 474th time is not interesting, right? It doesn't work. So we need something else. And to illustrate this point, I have made an invention. This little thing, I get, call it the Get Lost of On 3000. It's a device you put on your dashboard. And every time you come to an intersection, something will happen. Either it will do nothing, half of the times it will do nothing, and then you can drive wherever you want. But about half of the times, it will actually tell you where to go. And it will randomly select left, right, or forward, right? Now try to get to work. Now all of a sudden, this is, a, is, is sort of a game, right? Now you have to, to, to think about where you made on. You, you have to constantly think and reevaluate. Where am I going? What's happening now? And you start even thinking long-term. So you might say, oh, 
I should turn left here, but I kind of don't want to, because if I turn left here, I'm gonna be right by the on-ramp to the freeway. And I really don't want to end up on the freeway, because if you turn on the freeway, I'm gonna go miles and miles away, and it's gonna be real mess to get around. So I'm actually gonna go straight here, and hopefully, you know, be as far away from that on-ramp as possible so that that doesn't happen. So now you're starting to actually make a game. And you can actually, now you get to work and you can be like, you won't believe what happened today when I went to work. I actually had to go through the harbor and this thing happened and that thing happened. And now you're getting an interesting thing. So I call this part acceptable failure. And it's a weird name, but it hopefully will become clear soon. So acceptable failure is the thing you don't have control over. So the, it's the known unknown, right? It can do things to you that you know it can do, but you don't know what it does. Like the Gitlossathon tells you right, left. You know, it won't tell you like, go buy a burger. That's not part of the vocabulary, but you don't know what it's gonna tell you in which direction and when it's gonna do it. It's not predetermined. If it was predetermined, you could sit at home and solve how to get to work, right? And that's actually the thing about a, a any kind of puzzle you can solve in advance, right? So if you do a crossword puzzle, you don't have to put the pen to the paper until you've solved the whole thing. You can solve it in your head and be like, I have the solution, write it out and be done with it. But with acceptable failure, something happens in the way, right? It would be a crossword puzzle that changes if you write something to it. And now you're like, oh, I thought I had this, but now that I wrote that, this has changed, so now I have to rethink something, right? It has to be balanced with mechanics. So if the Gislothathon tells you where to go 99% of the uh, intersections, you're kind of going to give up, right? Because you're going to get to, to your work, but it's going to take forever. It's going to feel pointless, right? And if, if the Gislothathon only tells you at once every seven weeks to go somewhere else, well, you don't kind of don't care. You're going your way anyways, and you don't really care because it's so rare that the thing will tell you differently. So it has to be balanced. And the final thing, which is the acceptable part, which is that people hate failure. They hate when the things don't go, go their way. And therefore, it's really hard when you actually get into it to design something like this that players will be OK with. Because a lot of times, people be like, hey, this gets lost on. I can just throw it out the window. I don't need it. I'll just go to work. Who cares, right? And there's a couple of good examples. So chance is a really obvious one, right? A die roll is a thing that people have sort of an acceptable idea of like, oh, you know, I don't control it, but I can accept it, right? Opponents is another one, right? Other people will take decisions that I don't agree with, but there are other people, so I accept that. Physics is another one, because they're kind of funny with physics. It's like, if I took a bouncy ball and I said, okay, I'm gonna throw it in that direction, guess where it's gonna end up? Right? And I throw it all in. Nobody's going to be able to guess because it's going to bounce around the room like 50 times and end up somewhere. But then when I do that and it ends up like there, are people going to, are you, I'm going to ask you, like, are you going to argue where, where it ended up? Everybody's thinking, no, it's you know, totally logical that it ended up there. We couldn't predict it, but it's logical because we sort of understand that physics is sort of a random thing. Right? It's not random, but if it's so complex that we feel it's random. Another one is human limitations. So the fact that I can't aim very fast. You know, if I shoot someone in a game, you know, I miss because I'm bad and it's on me, right? Um, so if we start adding these together, we can actually figure out that uh, we actually get sort of, now we have a real game, which we have all three. And we can actually take away different parts. So if we take away goals, if we just have acceptable failure and mechanics, we get a sandbox. Right? So if you play GTA and you're not following the missions, you're sort of just goofing around and things happen. And it's a little bit out of your control, but it's also a bunch of mechanics you know how to play with. But you're just goofing around. There's lots of games where you can just like goof around. Like Minecraft is mostly sort of a sandboxy game that doesn't really have a goal that way. It's just like whatever you make out of it. Right? And you can think the same way uh, about removing mechanics. Right? So if you have randomness and chance and something out of your control, and then you have a goal to get that something, that's pretty much gambling, right? If you bet on horses, you know, the, the, the acceptable failure is whatever the horses do. They're out of your control, and the goal is to make the one you care about win, but you have no way of influencing it, right? 
So this creates sort of a way to, to break down games. So let's break down a game. I'm going to use Monopoly because everybody knows Monopoly. Uh, so obviously, uh, you can buy and sell things. You can uh, you know, walk around. Um, you end up on somebody's street, and then you uh, have to pay them. These are all the mechanics. Then you have the die rolls and the cards, and that's obviously acceptable failure. That's something you know, you're not in control over. And other, also the opponents. And then you have the goal, which is Monopoly. Get a Monopoly, right? So Monopoly sucks. It, it is a game. It fills all this thing, but it still sucks. So we need to do something. We need turning points. And this is kind of the core idea. Uh, a turning point in a story is where something changes. So I call these situational pivots. And situational pivot is kind of what you want to build as a game designer when you build a game. So what is a situational pivot? It is a sub-goal. So it's not the main goal. It's a sub-goal that changes the situation of the, the game. It is a mechanical switch, if you will. So there's a switch that can be in multiple stages, usually one or not too many. Uh, it is controllable by mechanics, so you can change it, but it's also controllable by acceptable changes, so sometimes you cannot control it, right? It's hopefully bi-directional, so it can go in both directions, so, you know, if it switches one way, it can switch the other way. And ideally, <clears throat> it has sort of shifting allegiances, so uh, one state is not inherently better than the other one. They're better in different situations, right? Night is good for some things, day is good for other things. Right? Which one you want depends on what you're doing. Right? So sometimes I illustrate it by like thinking of a gear shift. Like a gear shift, there's no, what's the greatest gear in a car? There isn't one, right? You want to have a different gear depending on if you're going up a hill, if you're going fast, if you're going slow. You, as you're driving, you're currently shifting the, uh, constantly shifting the gear to another gear to, to be at the best state, right? So imagine a, you're driving a car, and the goal is obviously going somewhere, but there's a monkey next to you, and the monkey sometimes just grabs the gear and just like janks it somewhere, right? And you have to like fight the monkey and drive the car, right? And you can think that sometimes you don't care about the monkey, sometimes the monkey pulls in a gear that you're fine with, and sometimes the monkey pulls in a gear you're really not fine with. So sometimes you have to think about how much do I care about the gear and how much do I care about driving? I'll get to where I'm going, but it'll be a lot easier if I'm in the right gear. But I also don't want to spend all my time fighting with a monkey, right? So we're kind of in this thing where you have a second sort of sub-goal and that you're currently changing. And depending on which gear you are, you are in a different situation. So let's get back to Monopoly. Uh, how do we fix Monopoly? So I'm going to add one rule, which is that now we're playing Monopoly in two modes. Either we're in... Uh, bull market. In bull market, all normal rules of monopoly apply, right? But there's a different state, which is the bear market. And in bear market, if you walk on somebody's street, they have to pay you, right? So it's completely reversed now, okay? And how do we switch these states? Well, we say every time you pass uh, go, you will do a die roll, and one in six, you will flip the market. But if two players agree that the market needs flipping, they can put some money in the bank and they get a die roll with, say, a uh, two-thirds chance of, of flipping the market, right? Okay, let's imagine normal Monopoly. How does normal Monopoly play out? It usually plays out something like this. One person gets a few buildings, other people step on those buildings, they pay him money, he gets richer, he buys more buildings, people step on those, he gets richer, he eventually wins the game. That's the story of most Monopoly games. It's kind of boring. This is the story of Monopoly games with my rules. Well, now you have somebody gets a lot of building, they get a lot of money. Two other players are like, hey, let's screw this guy over. Let's flip the market. So they pay some money, and hopefully, 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 oh my god, they flipped the market. And now all the, this guy has all these buildings, and people start stepping on them. And he's handing out 
money left and right. And he's telling the other people, oh, somebody, please, don't you want to flip the market? You've gotten so much money now. Don't you, you know, aren't you really, in the, you know, oh, look at all your houses. Don't you want to flip? And eventually he might be able to convince someone, right? And as the story goes, you can see how the, the game flips from one direction to the other, right? And all of a sudden, this person is in charge, and then that person is in charge, and it goes back and forth, and now you get this interesting story, right, from a single flip. Um, so the problem with situational pivots uh, is that they're really rare in the, in the wild. Reality doesn't work like this, and that means that if we're trying to make games that copy reality, we we'll run into problems. I can think of like one good one that I've thought of, which is cavitation for sub, uh, uh, submarines. So when a propeller moves slowly, it doesn't produce bubbles, right? But when, uh, when a propeller moves fast enough, there's enough low pressure on the backside of the, for the water to start boiling. And that actually produces bubbles. And that's why you see you know, bubbles in propellers. That's actually water boiling because of low pressure. And that makes a lot of noise. So if you're a submarine captain, you can choose either I go really fast, but I make a lot of noise, or I can go really slow and I'm really silent, right? And here you have this sort of dichotomy, which one do I pick, right? The problem, of course, is <clears throat> the other subway, subway captains can't force you to do one or the other thing, right? You have total control over it. So it's not ideal, right? Another one um, would be Formula One, right? Think of Formula One when it's raining is a completely different sport to when it's not raining. Every time it starts raining, everything is up in the air. Some drivers become terrible, some drivers become great. Some think, oh, it's gonna stop raining, so we're gonna switch, you know, we're not gonna switch tires, and some pe think, people think, oh, it's gonna stop raining, so we better switch tires right now, right? So you sort of have this really interesting thing. Again, the, the drivers can't control raining, so that's, you know, not perfect. Counter-Strike is a hugely successful game because it has actually several really good pivots. So the obvious one is the, the bomb has been planted. The moment you hear the bomb has been planted, the game is sort of flipped up uh, upside down. Now, you know, not one team isn't defending anymore, they're attacking and vice versa, right? So that's sort of a turning point, except there's some issues there, you can't turn it back. Like, in my opinion, Counter-Strike would be a lot better if you could disarm the bomb, and then the terrorists could get the bomb again and, and arm it again, and then have it disarmed again, and you know, you could have multiple switches, and you could have these amazing storylines. Um, so, my goal, uh, what I've realized, when I started this, I thought, oh, situational pivots are these few point, like have a major situational pivot in your game and you're good. And now when I've gotten more experience, I actually find that everything can be a situational pivot if you think about them as situational pivots. So for instance, uh, a good example would be in uh, the AWP, which is the most powerful gun in, in Counter-Strike. And this is a mural from when a player called uh, simple, drop down from that ledge and kill two players in a professional Counter-Strike match. Now, why is, why is there a big deal when one player managed to kill two other players? That shouldn't be a big deal. Well, the fact that he did it using this gun is super impressive because the gun is the most powerful gun in the game, but it's also one of the most worthless guns in that particular situation. So just having that gun changes the situation of the game. It changes what, you know, how you should play the game. And what he was able to do in that situation was magical because the situation was not, you know, in his advantage. Uh, Dota is another one. It's, it's full of situational pivots. Do I have a teleport scroll? Do I, you know, lots and lots of things. They're kind of obtruse and, you know, Dota is a weird game, um, but you can definitely tell in a lot of esports and sort of replayable titles, things like this. So I think I'm running out of time, and that's my talk. Do you have time for questions? Okay, we have time for questions. If anybody has any games they like me to uh, analyze or critique using this model, you can, you can, go ahead. Well, tell me whether this was a pivot or not. Uh, years ago, I lived in a house with a bunch of people before the internet, and you know, half the time crankshafts and watching other people crankshafts, and it was 
before and it's kind of like not lit. So we introduced this floating pond where one pond on your side and one pond on the other is uh, capable of exploding. It takes the pond goes, the paper goes, and everything wants to go around it goes. You know which one is yours, the other person knows which one is theirs, but you don't know each other. Ah. I, I would say that's a pretty good one. Uh, although I have to say chess is an awesome game and pretty much every move you make in chess is a situational pivot because you've changed the situation of the game. So chess is kind of magical for that and that's one of the reasons chess is such a, you know, it's such an enduring game. So yeah, I also, if you're into gaming, uh, I would recommend the greatest website, uh, web page on the internet is Wikipedia's page called Glossary on Chess, and it's just a, like a list of all the terms in chess, and it's like amazing. It never ends. So, yeah. Any other questions? Don't be shy. If you are shy, you can come up and ask me afterwards. That's totally cool, too. So, I guess that's it. Oh, wait, there's one more. That's me. So, oh, TeamSpeak, that's totally old. Uh, that's an old slide, sorry about that. So don't go there. Uh, but you can definitely find me on Twitter, that's not so old. And you can find me uh, on email and my wildly psychedelic website.